back with former world champion Barry Michael. Barry, stage two now of your uh, later part of your career. And there were some fantastic fights in the later part. None tougher than Frank the Tank Ropes. And that, that was on the 16th of the 2nd, 1983, Ash Wednesday. It was just maybe 45 to 50 degrees in the middle of the ring? They reckon it was 55 degrees under the ring lights, and uh, I think it was about 46 on the day, but it, they reckon it was about 55 degrees under the ring lights. And look, you, you know... You could basically die under that type you could, of heat without you, pressure. You certainly could, but without, I mean, without the conditions, just Frank alone. Frank was yeah. the, the hardest, strongest, you know, toughest machine that I ever fought. and. Uh, he just walked through everything I threw at him and finally, you know, the conditions and the punches, uh, you know, wore him down. But that was certainly the, I think, the hardest night of the office in my career I had, you know, because of the actual Even pressure 55 from 55 degrees heat. That... Oh, I, was, I was glad when it was over, I tell you, but um, it was at one of Melbourne my... Melbourne Town Hall, it was a packed yeah, house. It was one of my greatest victories and, uh, you know, Frank and I are great mates today and, uh, you know, a true warrior he was, Frank, and just incredibly strong. As we both were at our respective weights, we fought at 63 and a half for that fight, uh, for the Australasian light world away title. But you know that that had to be the hardest night I think I ever had in a ring, probably except for losing the world title, which I don't don't include because I didn't really it wasn't really me when I lost my world title, yep. which is another story. All right, Baz, on the 22nd of February 1985. Graham Brook, the man they said was uh, probably the next Lionel Rose, and he was undefeated and and what have you. At Festival Hall, you uh, you took him on and really ended a career again. What what had happened there? You know, Graham and I had sparred from the time Graham was about 14, similar to Lester. Lester was 12, and Graham went on to win 21 straight fights. I'd lost my Commonwealth title to Claude Noel, who six months before had been world lightweight champion, and I lost it. And I lost it on a 15-round split decision at Festival Hall. I had my life savings on the line. I had an injured left hand. I put my uh, I, I put 20 bucks on that fight I, on you, and I was only I was only 15. <laughs> 20 bucks on you that night to beat Graham. Sorry, yeah, Graham. but with, I lost to Claude Noel, and you know I mean I, he, he was world champion, you know, six months prior, and then but the the 15 round really destroyed him. He was destroyed after the fight. Um, and I lost my title and it sort of looked like my career was going into decline and then Graham about less than a year later won the Commonwealth title off Claude Noel and uh, then Graham had to fight me because I was number one in the Commonwealth and uh, you know we fought we went 12, 12 rounds and look the, you know third round Graham hit me with a triple left hook and hemorrhaged my right eye and he was a beautiful boxer but I just kept the pressure on him and the body punches took their toll and I won a unanimous decision uh, over Graham and, as you said, probably hurt his career quite a bit. But Graham and I are great mates today and yeah, one of the most beautiful a, yeah. blokes. And, you know, he was such a talented fighter, Graham, oh, too. He, awesome. He, yeah, know. he had the triple left hook. Same tonight. as Lionel, yeah. 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 Now, a bit after that, Baz, maybe six months after that, you got your first shot at a world title up against none other than Lester Ellis. Really, the, the, uh, you know, the golden boy of Australian boxing at the time, he was... Uh, you know, the working class kid that was taken Australia by storm and you, you were like the, old the cagey <laughs> old fox that, that was going to ruin the party pooper. Yeah. Talk, talk us into that, Baz. It was, well, it was it's sort of, you know... It's, July 1985, 24 what, years ago, what, over 24 years. What happened was Lester and I had sparred a lot, you know, like over the years and I picked him as a future world champion when I was 22 and he was 12. We became great mates, we sparred a lot, we trained a lot. Then I went away to Queensland after I beat Ropus and when I came back, uh, I'd you know, been away from Melbourne for quite a while and Lester had gone up the ladder and, and uh, we, we had two spars in, in my gym and the first one I wasn't in good condition for and Lester got away with me and the second one about two weeks later I got away with Lester and then I said to my dad one night, Dad, I think you know, we should challenge Lester for his world title and my dad basically said, I think you've got rocks in your head and I think maybe you should retire because you can't make the weight. I hadn't done it in 10 years and I said, Dad, I'd walk through a brick wall to fight for a world title I'll, you know, and I went and had my fat content weight underwater and they ascertained that I could, at around about 6% body fat, I could comfortably make the weight providing I stuck to a calorie controlled strict diet, which I did. But first of all, we had to get them to accept. And by then, Dana Goodson, who trained me briefly, was training Lester. He'd jumped ship after I'd collapsed in Miami with a heel injury before a big nationally televised fight in the United States and a, and a world title fight, which we had that had fallen through, another one. Um, and the Ellis camp signed because, one, it was the biggest payday out there for him, and two, Dana Goodson 
told them that I couldn't make the weight because Dana saw me struggle to make, I think, probably nine stone 10 or nine stone or 60, about 62, and I had to make 58.9. Yeah. He saw me struggle to do that in Hawaii, and uh, Dana is no longer with us now. We end up, I was filthy on him for what he did, jump and ship and train in Leicester, but we end up mates after I did beat Leicester. But uh, that's one of the, another one of the reasons why they signed, to because uh, they thought that I'd be too weak. I hadn't made the weight in 10 years, and... As it turned out, because I was so determined and dedicated and went into a health farm and, and stuck to the, the diet, I was down to the weight a month before the fight. And after that fight, you won the world title. It must have changed your whole life, Bass. Did it change your life? Um, to be honest with you, I'd been Australian champion for many years and I was Commonwealth champion twice and i travelled the world already. And I, I, I thought it would change my life more. I, probably because I'd beaten the golden boy, a lot of people were dirty on me. Um, and I, I didn't really get this, or didn't get the sponsorship, or I didn't get any sponsorship to be honest. Did a lot of appearances and things, and basically got the, got the key to the city. You know, wherever I went, yeah. people would want to buy me drinks and talk to me and stuff like that. I mean, it changed my life. For when, when you win a world title, a legitimate world title, Does it, changes, it changes you as a person. I don't think it changes you as a person. Didn't change me as a person. I mean, a lot of people. I'm still a knockabout from the western suburbs. Uh, I've mixed with you know um, politicians. I've mixed with you know superstars of show business and whatever, but I think I'm still the same person. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a Western suburb boy. For that. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think I've changed. Um, it, look, I think it does can change some people, you, you, but by then, I mean, my career, unlike like Jeff and Lester, they went up like rockets, you know, they got the accolades early. I mean, I had them over a period of time yeah. steadily and you, you basically... Uh, you know, grow to become accustomed to it, you know, yeah. I when guess, you know. I was 30 at that stage, and but to be honest with you, and I'm in the process of doing a book, as I said to you, uh, my good mate John Casey and I, we've done nine chapters, and or maybe ten, or John might have done ten by now, because he, he's taken down a lot of stuff we've been right through my career. Um, and it, it starts where I lose the title of Lockridge and then goes, goes, uh, goes backwards from there. But, um, yeah, the, the book's going to be coming out... We hope to get it out by Christmas, out, out next year, I'd say. And it's going to be called Crown of Thorns because the world title just didn't basically give me what I expected it to, to be honest. And it's a 15-chapter book and it's a 15-round 15 15 fight, so it all, all suits in. You made three successful defences, Baz, and you fought Rocky Lockridge at Blazers Nightclub, Windsor, Berwickshire, United Kingdom. But it wasn't you, was it? Well, that I had... It was in 1987, August. August the 9th, 1987. I, ha I hadn't fought for 12 months. So I'd signed a contract with Frank Warren, who was my last manager, who I won't say anything nice about him. Um, I see Joe Kalsagi just sued him successfully for quite a bit of money, which a lot of his ex-fighters have sued him, and I tried to sue him, but it got too expensive. Um, but I signed with Frank Warren because he promised me Barry McGuigan. He paid me really good money for my first against defence against Najib Daho, who had actually beaten me in Wales when I fought him with a busted left hand and a, an eardrum, new eardrum grafted in my left ear, lost an eight-round decision to him for £400. He paid me really good money to defend the world title against him in Manchester. Then didn't get me a fight for 12 months. I came home to Australia um, looking to fight either Lester or Jeff. There was talk about both of them. And uh, I made the mistake of, after what going to see Jeff Fennick against Tony Miller, made the mistake of going to Lazar's nightclub and... Uh, Ended up in a horrendous fight there, got smashed up, my nose was smashed really badly, which is all going to be in the book. Had to be rebroken re and reconstructed, and uh, nearly less than four months later, I had to defend the world title against Lockridge. Uh, I did everything wrong, I struggled to make the weight, really struggled to make the weight, and my nose just couldn't take a shot anymore. I broke in the first round, my right ear drum busted in the second. But take nothing from Lockridge, he was undoubtedly one of the greatest fighters I fought, but he didn't fight the real Barry Michael, I don't think. Uh, he never knocked me down, but he busted me up pretty bad. Um, I tell people, you know, he was lucky. They called him Lucky Lockridge. Lucky he didn't kill me. <laughs> I had him worried about the fifth round, though. He, they were worried he was going to be charged with manslaughter after the fight. <laughs> All right, Baz, 48 fights, 15 KOs, 9 losses. 48 wins. 48 wins, sorry. 60 pro fights. 60 yeah. pro fights and uh, a fantastic record. After a break, we'll be back with uh, what you're doing now. So, Thanks, uh,